All right. Jared, by the way, preached a cracker of a sermon last Sabbath. Amen? I'd sent Jared a text last night because I listened to it yesterday. Brilliant sermon, Jared. There was only one small problem with Jared's sermon, which I think I'm going to remedy this morning, and uh, you'll see what that is. So let's begin with prayer, and then we'll see if I'm able to make that small remedy. You'll see what it is. Father in heaven, we love you. Your goodness is so awesome, so great. I want to thank you again, Father, for being back here in Australia, uh, back here where my phone is rescued, and so many things to be thankful for. Great to be back in Sabbath school class this morning with those beautiful young people, and great to be back here with the beautiful oldies as well. Uh, Father, please be with us now as we turn our attention to the book of Jeremiah, and as we continue our walk through the Old Testament. Father, we're coming now down toward the end of our Old Testament journey. And Father, we're looking for clarity. We're looking for uh, you to, to give us some sense of closure that, that we'll have a sense every time we look back on the Old Testament from this day forward. We'll say, yep, yep, I have a feel for the shape, the feel, the, the, the sense of what's taking place in the Old Testament. And Father, the book of Jeremiah is a hugely important book. And today, help us to note the unique contribution that Jeremiah makes to Scripture. And uh, Father, may we not only note that, but may we note the unique contribution that the book of Jeremiah can make to our lives. Be with us now as we turn our attention to you. May you turn your attention by the Spirit to us, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Let everyone say, Amen. Amen. All right, let's talk about the book of Jeremiah. Join me there if you would. Just want to reiterate that Jared did an absolute stunner of a job last Sabbath. Sorry, fellas, I haven't gotten to listen to the other sermons yet, but I've heard they were outstanding and really looking forward to them. Our sermon today is titled, So, Meet, Reap. So, Meet, Reap. And we're going to be taking a look at the book of Jeremiah. I want to start by just making a few observations, as I often like to do, to give us a feel for the shape, the general shape of the book and of the prophet uh, after whom the book is named. First of all, Jeremiah's prophetic ministry lasts about 40 years and spans the last five kings of Judah. You will recall that the kings of Israel were basically an uninterrupted trajectory of downward spiral into uh, transgression, rebellion, and apostasy. Judah, however, was a little different. There were certainly some very bad kings in Judah, but there were also some great kings in Judah. And uh, there were some not great, not terrible kings in Judah, more of a roller coaster ride. The book of Jeremiah is not an easy book to read. If you tried to read it in preparation for this uh, sermon series, I find it to be very difficult to read, more so than, say, the book of Isaiah or Daniel or something like that, for, for the reason that Jared articulated last Sabbath, and that is that unlike, say, the book of um, Jonah, I think was Jared's example, where it follows a storyline, and, uh, okay, Jonah was here, and then he was in the uh, ship, and then they threw him overboard, and then he was swallowed by a fish. There's a storyline to it. The book of Jeremiah, it, there's basically no storyline. Very, very difficult to follow the book of Jeremiah in any sort of narrative sense. There are little cameos of things that happen to Jeremiah, but for the most part, the book of Jeremiah is an uninterrupted series of prophecies, primarily of doom and of judgment, which makes it not the most entertaining book to read. Uh, Jeremiah is re referred to sometimes as the weeping prophet, as contrasted with Isaiah, who is often referred to as the gospel prophet. One of the reasons is that the gospel, or the book of Isaiah, is filled with messianic prophecies and promises and anticipations, where the book of Jeremiah, there are precious few. Um, as Jared brought out last Sabbath, if you go to the New Testament, you'll find the book of Isaiah is quoted with regularity. Jeremiah is quoted comparatively much less than the book of Isaiah. Uh, Jeremiah, one of the fascinating things about the book of Jeremiah is that he is often asked by God to perform little illustrations or, or little object lessons. Uh, on one occasion, he's told to take a sash and to bury the sash in the ground and let it sit there for a number of days and then go get the sash out and tie it on his waist. He goes down to the potter's house, and there's an illustration there. He takes a broken flask and brings a number of the elders of Israel or Judah out to, uh, uh, outside the city and smashes the flask and says that just as this flask is smashed, so you will be smashed by Babylon. Um, on another occasion, God says to Jeremiah, go buy a plot of land and then take the deed for that plot of land and put it in a jar for preservation. A lot of these sort of interesting object lessons. On another occasion, there's a basket of figs that are placed before Jeremiah, really goodly figs and then some really rotten and bad figs. And there's sort of these object lessons and none of them have particularly happy 
uh, endings. In fact, none of them do. Uh, as we've already mentioned, very few Messianic prophecy, prophecies or promises. Uh, Jeremiah is regularly ignored in a best-case scenario, and in a worst-case scenario, happens often in the text, he is persecuted. He's placed in a prison, he's placed in a cistern, uh, he's smacked across the face. Jeremiah is what I'm calling the transition prophet. And what we mean by that is that up to this point, there have been uh, anticipations and harbingers of a coming calamity, a coming judgment. Judah has already been in captivity to Assyria for more than a century, and we've had a sense that at some point we're going to have to transfer out of the kings and into the exile. Jeremiah is that transition prophet. Jeremiah actually lived not only during the last five kings of Judah, but he was there in Jerusalem when it was besieged by Nebuchadnezzar and destroyed. And uh, then the Babylonians, uh, fascinatingly, actually took Jeremiah out of prison, treated him very well, very kindly. So he survived in that transition. The last king of Judah, Zedekiah, uh, had his eyes poked out, his thumbs cut off, and he was paraded through the streets of Babylon. Jeremiah saw it all. So it's kind of a fascinating thing to think about. Here he was for decades saying, this is going to happen, this is going to happen, this is going to happen, this is going to happen. And in the days of Jeremiah, there were a lot of false prophets that were coming out and saying, no, 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 Jeremiah, no, peace and safety, everything's going to be fine, the yoke of Babylon will be broken, it's all going to be well. Jeremiah was hugely unpopular and therefore persecuted because he didn't bear good news. He kept saying no. Yes, Josiah was a, was a positive king, and it was not enough, however, to, to right the ship. And uh, catastrophe is coming, judgment is coming, Babylon is coming, a conquering power from the north, it is going to happen. And yet many false prophets and others saying, no, 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 Jeremiah is wrong, and you actually find several instances in the book of Jeremiah where he's in conflict, direct confrontation with these false prophets. But he lived not only to talk about what would happen, but to see with his own eyes what actually did happen. And uh, he also wrote the book of Lamentations, which is basically just another way of saying the book of crying. And so a bit of a difficult prophet and a, di a bit of a difficult life uh, would be an understatement. Here are Judah's last five kings. Josiah, I put the four-star rating up there. He was one of the two best kings in Judah, with Hezekiah being the other one. Jared talked about him last Sabbath. Then there were two short-lived kings. Jehoahaz lived uh, reigned just three months, followed by Jehoiakim, 11 years. Jehoiakim, again, just three months. And then Zedekiah, the last prophet of Judah, just 11 years. And Jeremiah's ministry began toward the end of King Josiah's reign. There was a kind of national optimism in the air. Josiah was a good king. He had destroyed many of the high places. He was seeking to return Israel back to the covenant. And there was a sense of positivity, optimism. Maybe things were looking up and the fate that had fallen on Israel maybe could be avoided in Judah. And Jeremiah shows up and says, not going to happen. Not going to happen. Just as the Assyrians took Israel capt uh, captive, Babylon will come and will plunder uh, Judah as well. And so he was unpopular. The book of Jeremiah, as you read it through, can be summarized in five words. And I want to walk you through these five words here today, the first of which is covenant. We'll come back to them. The second is treacherous. If you're taking notes, first word, covenant. Second word, treacherous. Third word, backsliding. Backsliding. Fourth word, desolate. Very important word. And uh, so let's talk about these five words. They're in, or these four words that we've put up so far, they're in the parenthesis that follow each of the words are the number of times that that word occurs in the book of Jeremiah. And with the sole exception of the first word, covenant, which occurs a few more times in the book of Deuteronomy, 26 in fact, uh, every other word occurs more, this particular word occurs more in the book of J uh, Jeremiah than every other book in the Old Testament by far in most cases. So for example, treacherous or treacherously occurs some 10 times, more than any other book in the Old Testament. Backsliding occurs some 13 times, more than any other book in the Old Testament. And desolate and or desolation occurs some 48 times, far more than any other book in the Old Testament. And the, and the interesting thing is, is as I read through the book of Jeremiah, I just had a notepad beside me, and I said, you know what, I'm just going to write down the words that jump out at me. I, I didn't go about this in any particularly systematic way. I just read through the book, and as a word would jump out at me, either because of the way it was used or the frequency with which it was used, I would just write it down. And when it was done, I had five words written down. Now, you'll notice that the, five is, the fifth is absent. We're going to come to that at the very end. Uh, the, the interesting thing was is that I'd written these five words down. I then went back into my Bible study programs, my computer programs, and I looked these words up. And as I've mentioned... 
with the exception of the word covenant, which understandably uh, occurs more in the book of Deuteronomy. That would make sense. It was the book that articulated the covenant. I think it occurs 26 times there. But in every other case, the word that I had just written down that had made an impression on me in reading the book through occurs with greater frequency, and I would say even greater intensity, though that's certainly subjective, in the book of Jeremiah. And so I thought to myself, how can you tell the whole story of a, a book that consists of 52 chapters in a single 45-minute sermon? And I'm going to try to do that today by honing in on these words. Let's start, first of all, with the word covenant. Come with me to Jeremiah chapter 11. Let's see the role that the word covenant plays in the book of Jeremiah. Not just the word, but the thing for which the word stands, the covenantal agreement that God had made with Abraham and with his descendants going all the way back to uh, Genesis chapter 12, appreciative of Jared bringing that out last Sabbath, bringing us back, reminding us of that initial covenantal promise that was made, how all of the families of the earth would be blessed through Abraham and his descendants, and then Jared contrasted that brilliantly with that opening picture of uh, Israel or Judah in Isaiah. You're sick from the top of your head to the sole of your foot and everything in between. So clearly the promise, clearly the potential has not been realized. And the word covenant and its usage in Jeremiah reminds us again of that great Abrahamic call and that great Abrahamic promise. But notice how the word covenant is used in chapter 11. We'll pick it up in verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, hear the words of this covenant and speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and say to them, this is the Lord speaking now through Jeremiah, thus says the Lord God of Israel, cursed is the man who does not obey the words of this covenant, speaking of the covenant contained in the law of Moses that was originally made, the promise to Abraham. Uh, verse 4, that I commanded your fathers in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt from the iron furnace saying, obey my voice and do according to all my command. So you will be my people and I will be your God, that I may establish the oath which I have sworn to your fathers to give them a land flowing with milk and honey. We're going to see that contrasted with the word desolate or desolation today, uh, as it is this day. And so I answered and said, so be it, Lord. Verse 6, so the Lord said to me, proclaim all these words in the cities of Judah, in the streets of Jerusalem, and say, hear the words of this covenant and do them. For I earnestly exhorted your fathers in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt until this day, rising early and exhorting them, saying, Obey my voice. Yet they did not obey or incline their ear, but everyone followed the dictates of his own evil heart. Therefore I will bring upon them all the words of this covenant which I commanded them to do, but which they have not done. And the Lord said to me, A conspiracy has been found among the, the men of Judah and among the inhabitants of Jerusalem. They have turned back to the iniquity of their forefathers who refused to hear my words, and they have gone after other gods to serve them. The house of Israel and the house of Judah have broken my covenant that I made with their fathers. The covenant was a double-edged sword. The covenant was not only the promise that God would prosper and bless Israel and that in them all the nations of the earth would be blessed. You might recall that at the close of the books of Moses, in Deuteronomy chapters 27 to 30, there were what were called the blessings and the cursings. And God basically said, look, this is going to work in a cause-effect relationship. If you are obedient to the covenant, if you find yourself in line with the stream of the way that I have created the world and the universe to work, you will be blessed. This will happen and this will happen. You will lend to nations and people will come to you and there will be prosperity and your flocks will prosper. It'll be great. If, however, you choose to go against the way that I have made the universe and the world to work, then you will place yourself outside of the stream of my blessing and judgment will come. And there will be cursings and this will happen and this will happen and this will happen and this will happen. So Jeremiah here is saying, and God is saying through Jeremiah, look, the covenant was for good and it was for blessing and it was for positivity. But the word of God that makes the covenant so powerful and so strong for positivity and for blessing and prosperity also makes it strong for judgment and for doom and for curse and punishment if you place yourself outside the parameters of the covenant. And so the book of Jeremiah opens with a reminder to Israel that you are the covenant people of God. But being the covenant people of God does not in and of itself secure you a place in heaven's favor. In fact, being the covenant people of God could actually increase your level of accountability and increase the level of punishment or judgment that you might face because you have an awareness that the surrounding nations were not privy to. So the word covenant, hugely important. Um, now the word treacherous, treacherous, and I'll just give you a few quotations. 
Surely as a wife treacherously departs from her husband, so you have dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel, says the Lord. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 20. Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 11. For the house of Israel and the house of Judah have dealt very treacherously with me, says the Lord. One more here. Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 1. Righteous are you, O Lord, when I plead with you. You let me talk with you about your judgments. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why are those happy who deal so, what? Treacherously. And you look up that word treacherously in the English, and it comes from the old French word to cheat, to betray, to be traitorous, right? You have, you have betrayed me. You have divorced me. You have not dealt squarely with me. And and it's fascinating because you find God saying repeatedly some 12 times in the book of Jeremiah, why did you do this to me? You betrayed me. You deceived me. You dealt treacherously, treacherously with me. And he uses the illustration of a spouse departing from their lover. Right? There was a connection. There was a bond. There was an intimacy. And God says, you abandoned me. You dealt traitoriously with me. You dealt treacherously with me. Another hugely important word that occurs more in Jeremiah than any other book of the Old Testament. The word backsliding is another one occurring some 13 times, far more than any other book. Jeremiah chapter 4 verse 7, the lion has come from his thicket, an allusion to Babylon that would come. The destroyer of nations, he's on his way, said Jeremiah. He has gone forth from his place to make your land desolate. Your cities will be laid waste without, inhabitant. Contra without an inhabitant. Contrast that with the promise that God had originally given to the children of Israel that you will inhabit a land flowing with milk and honey. Milk and honey. Milk and honey. And, and those of us that are vegan or inclined that way, we might think, well, that doesn't even sound so good. But when you talk about milk and honey, in order to have milk, you have to have lots of grass. It's green. It's beautiful. And in order to have honey, you have to have lots of flowers and flowering trees. So God says it's going to be a beautiful land, lots of grass, lots of green, lots of flowers, lots of trees. It's not a desolation. It's not a desolate wilderness. But here we are centuries later, and God says your land will be desolate. Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 34, Then I will cause to cease from the cities of Judah and from the streets of Jerusalem the voice of mirth. No more happiness. In fact, Jeremiah was actually acting out. He embodied this. He was told by God, don't go to weddings, don't go to happy places, do not marry. It's really tragic, Jeremiah's life. He was told, do not be happy. I, I need you to be an unhappy prophet of gloom is basically what it boils down to. The voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, the voice of the bride, no more weddings, the land will be desolate. Desolate. Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 11, I will make Jerusalem a heap of ruins a den of jackals. I will make the cities of Judah desolate without an inhabitant. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 12, verses 10 to 13. Many rulers have destroyed my vineyard. They have trodden my portion underfoot. They have made my pleasant portion a desolate wilderness. And he notes there the rulers. A theme that comes up again and again in Jeremiah is prophet and priest are alike ungodly. Prophet and priest, prophet and priest, prophet and priest, prophet and priest. You get a sense as you read through the book of Jeremiah that there was a show of religiosity. There was a sense that, hey, we're fine. We've got our prophets. We've got our priests. And yet the indictment by Jeremiah of the religious leaders of his day is amazing. Prophet and priest, he says, are alike corrupt. Prophet and priest are idolaters. Prophet and priest go into the high places to sacrifice to the gods. And so here he says, they have made it desolate, these leaders. He also calls them shepherds. Desolate, it mourns me, God says. You can just feel the heart of God breaking. This is not what he had hoped for. This is not what he had planned. In another place in Scripture, actually in the book of Isaiah, it says that when God administers a punishment, when he administers a judgment, it's foreign to his nature. It's a strange act. God who is the creator, God who is the life giver, God who is the one that wants to bless, and not just bless, but lavish with blessings. It's contrary to his nature, to his feelings, to his emotions, to, to want to, to, to hurt or to curse or to punish or to bring judgment. And here God is saying, this desolation mourns me. The whole land is made desolate because no one is taking what I'm saying to heart. The plunderers have come on all the desolate heights in the wilderness, for the sword of the Lord shall devour from one end of the land to the other end of the land. No flesh will have peace. They have sown wheat, but they have reaped thorns. They have put themselves to pain, but they do not profit. Be ashamed of your harvest because of the fierce anger of the Lord. Our sermon today is titled, So... Meet reap. And it comes from this passage right here. Be ashamed of your harvest. You were sowing what you thought was wheat, but then you reaped thistles and thorns. Be ashamed of your harvest. It's just common sense, axiomatically true, that whatever you sow, you'll reap. 
right? You put in tomatoes, you reap tomatoes. You put in corn, you reap corn. You put in wheat, wheat you reap wheat. wheat. Judah was putting in disobedience. They were putting in idolatry. They were putting in injustice. They were putting in dishonesty. They were putting in rebellion. And they thought they were going to reap the blessing of the Lord. They thought, oh yeah, we're going to reap prosperity. We're going to reap the blessings of Jehovah. And God says, no, 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 no. You're going to reap something far different. You're going to reap not the blessings of the covenant, but the curses of the covenant. Be ashamed of your harvest, he says here. This is a lesson for us to take very close to our own hearts. This is not something that applies only to ancient Israel who was operating under the direct theocratic covenantal connection with God. This applies to us. If we sow dishonesty, we will not reap prosperity. If we sow gossip, we will not reap deep and abiding friendships. If we sow one thing, we will reap that thing. This is a lesson for all of us to take to heart. If we sow impure thoughts, we will reap a bad marriage. If we sow uh, impure thoughts, we will reap adultery, either in our thought or in our hands. If we sow in a certain way, if we sow talking down to people or being unkind to people or being uh, uh, less than polite or upfront with people, we will sow bad relationships, right? We sow and then we reap. Sow, meet, reap. This is exactly what Paul says in the book of Galatians, chapter 6, verse 7. Don't be deceived. Don't kid yourself about this, he says. This is axiomatic. Right? This is a simple, mathematical, you know, biological, ecological reality. Be not deceived. God will not be mocked. For whatever a man or a woman sows, that he will also... What's the word? Don't, don't kid yourself, he says. You can't sow dishonesty and reap prosperity. You can't sow cruelty and reap kindness. You can't sow insincerity and reap genuineness or transparency or vulnerability. What you sow, it says, you will reap. So the lesson for us today and the lesson of the book of Jeremiah is sow, meet, reap. For centuries and centuries, you've been sowing idolatry, sowing rebellion, sowing injustice, sowing oppression, sowing uh, all of this transgression, and now you will reap the bitter harvest of judgment and the bitter harvest of punishment. This is something we've talked about in here before. In fact, the quotations that I'm going to share with you right now are quotations I've already shared in here. And probably over the course of my pastorate here, you will hear these quotations again and again and again because I just want this idea, this simple idea that will come up, we'll have opportunity to discuss it in many passages of Scripture. I want it to register in your mind with such a solidity and such a firmness that I want it just concretized in your brain, what we're going to talk about right here. And that is there is a giant difference between the idea that God gave them up and God gave them up to. We read three times in Romans chapter 1, God gave them up. And many people read that and they stop right there. God gave them up, period. As if the God who would send his own son to die for us would just insociently or, or casually or serendipitously just give us up. No, 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 no. Paul says in another place, also in Romans, if God didn't spare his own son but freely delivered him up for us all, how will he not give us every other lesser blessing? If God gave us an infinite blessing, why would he keep from us a finite blessing? Right? And so God never, ever gives up on people. Can the church say amen? But what God does do is he gives us up to not giving us up, period, but he gives us up to. And it says he gave them up to a debased mind. He gave them up to their immorality. He gave them up to their perversity. The translation is God gave them over to their own choices. God says, hey, listen, you, you, are you sure that's what you want to sow? I would advise you not to sow that. Don't sow that. Don't sow that. Don't sow that. And if we insist on sowing, God says, I will give you over to the, the product, the, 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 the harvest that you have sown. This isn't me arbitrarily coming in as some punisher and saying, okay, you know, you're, you're, you're punishing. No, this is God saying, you reaped that, you get that. You reap that, you, you, you sowed that rather, you reap that. You sow that, you reap that. You sow that, you reap that. Sow, meet, reap. Two statements from Ellen White. These are the statements I was mentioning before. The first, Ellen White, one of the founders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, she says in a book called Last Day Events, I was shown that the judgments of God... The what, everyone? I was shown that the judgments of God would not come directly out from the Lord upon them. She's talking about at the end of time, when the seven last plagues are poured out on the world. She says, I was shown that the judgments of God did not come directly from the Lord on to the wicked at the end of time. It happens like this, in this way. 
they place themselves beyond his, what's the word? Big difference. Between God actively sending the punishment and God simply honoring their choice to be outside of his protective providence. She continues. He warns. Hey, no, 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 don't, don't, don't. He corrects. That's not what I told you to do. He reproves. He points out the only path of safety. Then if those who have been the objects of his special care will follow their own course, independent of the Spirit of God, after repeated warnings, this is basically a summary of the history of the Old Testament right here. If they choose their own way, then he does not commission his angels to, what's the word? To prevent Satan's decided attacks upon them. You see, friends, this is, a, this is a country mile away or a country kilometer, if you will, away from the notion that God is actively sending an arbitrary or otherwise capricious punishment. That's not what's happening. No, 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 no. God says, you've sown this, you reap this. You've sown this, you've reap th you reap this. And here, in, in, with perfect clarity, Ellen White says, when the judgments finally fall upon the wicked, it doesn't happen because God is actively pushing his judgments upon them, at least not in the case of the seven last plagues, and in many instances also in other passages, it's because God is protecting, he's protecting, and then the people are saying, hey, we don't want your protection. We don't want to live according to the covenant. We don't want to live according to your ways. And God's like, are you sure? I, I, I don't think this is a choice you want to make. And we see the patience of God, the forbearance of God, the, the long suffering of God to finally withdraw or remove his protective providence. And when that happens, then Satan has his way. Here's another one, this one from Great Controversy, the book that I was so happy to hear. Where's Melissa at? Melissa Hamper, I'm looking for Melissa. Where are you? There you are. Thank you for getting those books out there, playing the role that you played. 300 plus Great Controversies, like three amens in the church. I was one of them, though, because I was converted by reading the book, The Great Controversy. Can the church at least say amen to that? Hallelujah. There's 300 of those silent preachers out in homes in our general area, and they're going to go with at least my prayers and I know they'll go with yours and others as well. We need to pray that these books remain on the shelf, just like my book remained on the shelf for a year and was picked up at a difficult time and uh, within a very short order, within a few months, I was totally changing the direction of my life and Jesus got a hold of my heart and here I am today. It's a great story. It's a beautiful thing. In that book, The Great Controversy, the opening chapter, Ellen White writes this, we cannot know how much we owe to Christ for the peace and protection that we enjoy. We talked about this in Sabbath school today. We're living in Australia, and it's even difficult to find something to get really passionate about in terms of an injustice, because for the most part, we are, we are insulated from these kind of terrible injustices that we see all around the world. Not that there aren't injustices here. I'm not suggesting that. But we don't have that same sort of in-your-face confrontation with injustice. And so she says here, we, we don't even know how much we owe to Christ for the peace and protection which we enjoy. It is the, what's the next word? restraining power of God that prevents mankind from passing fully under the control of Satan. The disobedient and unthankful have great reason for gratitude for God's mercy and, unlong, and long suffering in holding in check the cruel malignant power of the evil one. But when men pass the limits of divine forbearance, that restraint is removed. This is exactly what's happening with Judah and Babylon. Here's this mighty power from the north, Babylon, that outnumbers Judah, much larger than Judah, crueler than Judah. Judah is like a fly before an oncoming locomotive. No hope, no chance. And God says, look, I'm protecting you here. I am protecting you from Babylon. And uh, Jer Jared brought this out as well, you know, when, when they were coming and, and some said, well, we're not going to trust in God. We're going to go to Assyria. And that actually happens here in Jeremiah as well. Some of them try to go to Egypt. Rather than trusting in God, they said, we'll trust in Egypt because here comes this locomotive of a power, the cruel power of Babylon, descending rapidly on uh, Judah. And God says, this is going to happen. I am simply honoring your choice. You have sown. You will now reap. God does not stand toward the sinner as an executioner. Can somebody say amen to that? There are whole religious systems predicated on the notion that God stands in antagonism toward us stands in hostility towards us, stands in tension toward us. But I'm so thankful that John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world. Can the church say amen? He loved the world. He doesn't stand as an executioner to us. He doesn't stand as hostile to us. It's not naturally, it's, 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 not, it's not what God wants to do. It's not a part of his, his nature, not that he violates his nature, but it's a strange thing for God to not bless. He wants to bless, he wants to lavish, he wants to give in the same way that parents that love their children want to do the same thing. This is what he longs to do and loves to do. But he also loves us just enough to allow the natural consequences of sowing 
to eventuate in reaping. If we sow positive, we reap positive. If we sow negative, we reap negative. God does not stand toward the sinner as an executioner of the sentence against transgression, but he leaves the rejecters of his mercy to themselves to, say it with me, to reap what they have sown. Sow, meet, reap. Hosea chapter 13 verse 9 says it this way, O Israel, in the old King James, O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself. This is not God arbitrarily, externally imposing a judgment. Israel, you destroyed yourself. I am your help. You destroyed yourself. You have destroyed yourself. And at the end of time, no one will be able to say, God did this to me. God will be able to say to every single person in this room and out of this room, I honored your choice for blessing or for cursing. I honored your choice. This is what you chose. This is what you reap. You have destroyed yourself. So here are our four words. We've purposely left the fifth vacant. Covenant is the beginning. They then dealt treacherously or traitoriously with, with God. They deceived him and abandoned him as a lover. They backslid away uh, from the original standing that they had with God, God then says, you will be desolate. And it's not without purpose that Jesus in the New Testament, when he made his final overtures to the house of Israel, he went into the temple in Matthew chapter 23, and eight times he says, woe to you, woe to you, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you pay tithe of mint and cumin and anise, but you have neglected the weightier matters of the law. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you travel the earth to make one convert, and yet you yourself won't obey the things that you urge them to obey with your finger. Woe to you, woe to you, eight times, woe to you. And then as he draws this terrible, climactic, and yet somehow still poetically beautiful rebuke to a close, he says these words, and they will be familiar to you. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, beginning in verse 37. How often I wanted to gather your hens, or gather your chicks together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing you rejected the evidences of my messiahship. You rejected the evidences of my divinity. Jeremiah could have said the same thing. Jeremiah here anticipates Jesus himself who stood, God would say to him to stand in the most populous of places. Stand in the temple, he would say, and tell them that the temple will be destroyed. Stand in the city gate and tell them there will be a fire that will burn in the city gates that, that will not go out. Stand in the markets and tell them that the voice of mirth and the voice of commerce will cease. He put Jeremiah in the, in the place of of, of c communication where there were people in the marketplace and he spoke these words and they just resisted, resisted, resisted and eventually they tried to kill him but he was rescued. Jesus, the same. He stood right in the crucible of culture. He stood right in that place and he said, man, I was trying to gather you together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings but you were not willing and then Jesus with, with pro prophetic significance, his words pregnant with the Old Testament, Jesus says, behold, your house is left to you desolate. Jesus knew exactly what word he was using and he used it with great intentionality. Jesus had begun his prophetic ministry by cleansing the temple and saying, take these things out of here. You have made my father's house a den of thieves. My father's house. That was three years before. Now, after three years of the rejection of the evidences of his divinity and his messianic identity, he says, your house, not my house, not my father's house. That was three years ago. You have sown, 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 and now you reap. Your house is left to you desolate. Jesus purposefully chooses this word. He, he reaches in. So five key words in Jeremiah. Covenant. You have abandoned the covenant that was established with Abraham. You have dealt treacherously with me. You have backslid away from the position that you should have occupied. Your land and your house is left to you desolate. And the final word, return. Oh, I tell you, this word just jumps out, and it jumps out on two fronts, and both of them are equally glorious. And church, I want you to hear this this morning. The first, uh, roughly half of the first times that the word return is used, God is saying, return to me, return to me, return to me, return to me. Even in the midst of apostasy, in the midst of rebellion, in the midst of idolatry, in the midst of reaping this terrible harvest that they have sown, God, the, the, the refrain, the chorus never stops, return to me, return to me. And then the second half of the returns in the book of Jeremiah are, and you will return to the land. You will return to the land. You will return. You will return. You will return. You will 
return. Let's just look at a few of these. Return, backsliding Israel, says the Lord. I will not cause my anger to fall on you, Jeremiah 3.12. Verse 14, return, O backsliding children, says the Lord. I am married to you. I will take you. I will take you. I will bring you to Zion. That's home. That's saying, I'll bring you home. Jeremiah 3, verse 22, return, you backsliding children. I will heal your backslidings. I will forgive. I will not just forgive. I will heal you of this infirmity. Jeremiah 24, verse 7, then I will give them a heart to know me that I am the Lord and they shall be my people and I will be their God for they will return to me with their whole heart. Return. Jeremiah 30, verse 3, for behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will bring back from captivity my people. Here's the transition. My people Israel and Judah, says the Lord, and I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers and they will possess it. By the way, this promise will eventually be filled, fulfilled, but not in the way that many would expect. The land will be returned to God's people, but it will be, as Jesus said, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the, parenthetical, new earth. The land will be given to the people of God. They will return to the promised land that was offered to Abraham. It wasn't just a piece of desert over in the Middle East. The land, the, the land that God promised to Abraham and to his descendants was a new earth, a new heaven where there isn't death, there isn't disease, there isn't treachery, there isn't all of these things that we've been discussing here. Verse, uh, Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 3, Therefore the Lord says, uh, Do not fear, O my servant Jacob, nor be dismayed, O Israel, for behold, I will save you from afar and your offspring from the land of their captivity. Here's this promise. Jacob will return. This verse occurs twice in Jeremiah 30, verse 3 and 46, verse 27. Identical verbiage. Jacob will return and have rest and be quiet and no one will make him afraid. There won't be this trepidation over Egypt or Assyria or Babylon. He will be at peace. Jeremiah 33, verse 11. Praise the Lord of hosts for the Lord is good for his mercy endures forever for I will cause the captives of the land to return as at the first. I love this idea. That despite your circuitous you know, rebellion, despite going way out of my plan for you, we can start this over and it will be just like it was at the beginning. God is not a holder of grudges. Can somebody say amen? 10,000 years from now, God's not going to remind you of that promise that you broke. When we return to God, it says that he separates our sins as far as the east is from the west and he buries our sins in the bottom of the ocean. It's a beautiful thing. God's, when we start with God, we start over with God fresh. This is what it means to be justified, just as if I'd never committed a sin. We say, God, forgive me for that sin I committed last week. And he says, what sin? You already confessed that. That sin is gone. We are starting fresh. I love that. Just as at the first. Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 7, I will cause the captives of Judah and the captives of Israel to return, and I will rebuild those places as at the first. He just takes this giant loop of apostasy, this giant loop of rebellion, this giant loop of transgression, and he basically says, we'll go back to that, that starting promise and covenant that I made with Abraham. We'll start the whole thing over together. You will return. And it reminded me when I read this today of that statement from Ellen White in The Desire of Ages where she says the very essence of the gospel is restoration. Church, listen to that. The very essence of the gospel, the good news is that God puts things back to how they were originally to restore, to give you another chance to start it just like it was at the first to rebuild those things. And when I was thinking about this, all I could think about was because I preached on this when I was down in Tasmania. That, that parable, more than any other single parable, and we're going to be talking about that next year. Jared and I will be announcing next year's um, theme uh, in the next few weeks. But here's the point. I had the privilege of preaching on Luke chapter 15 in the Tasmania camp meeting and, and the parable of the prodigal son. And I was just reminded again, I began to become impassioned and, and emotional as I was preaching. No parable, no teaching, no sermon encapsulates the essence of the story of Scripture and of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the parable of the prodigal son. Here is a man, a young man, whose life was desolate. Jesus paints this in the most robust of Jewish terms. He was, a, a ensla he was in, employed by a foreigner, a.k.a. a Gentile, and not just employed by a Gentile, but employed to feed pigs. Jesus is just twisting the cultural theological knife as deep as he possibly can. The man was desolate. He was emotionally wrecked. He was theologically wrecked. He was culturally wrecked. He was socially wrecked. His family was wrecked. It was over. And then it says that the boy came to himself and he said these words, I will leave and return to my father. Beloved, I want you to notice both aspects of that. You cannot return to your father until you leave. You have to leave something. You have to leave that in order to come to that. You can't occupy both. This is what Israel tried to do. They tried to have this and this. 
They wanted Baal and Jehovah. They wanted Asherah and Yahweh. They wanted this and they wanted that. And, and just because of simple geography, the young boy knew, if I'm going to go to my father, I have to leave this place. I've got to leave the pigs to go to my dad. Beloved, I want you to know today, you've got to leave the pigs to go to your dad. God says, return. Even now. Even now, he says, return. Let's pray. Father in heaven, these are words that I wasn't planning on saying. You know that. I didn't stand up planning to say these words, but I just feel that you've laid them on my heart. And Lord, it's been good in a way to be away from the church, to get a little bit of perspective, to come back and just looking forward to 2016. I think it's going to be a great year. Father, we've got a great team, um, but it's a, it's a team too small. We still have positions vacant. We have people that, that are not stepping into positions. And Father, that's fine. We can get 500 people here on Sabbath, but we struggle on nominating committee, Lord. What's going on here? So, Father, I'm just praying that you will just help us to return, as we just sang, back to that first love, that first light with clarity, prioritizing, setting examples for our children, for our brothers, for our sisters, and for others, that, that this isn't just a casual thing that we do, something we do on the weekend, but, but we're taking Jehovah seriously, and we're taking his love for us seriously. Father, help us to realize today we can't reap casual religion. We can't sow casual religion and reap the harvest of Pentecost. We're not just going to sit around happily and socializing and then reap the great promises that are found in the New Testament. Father, I'm praying for revival, for reformation in this church, in these families, in my own life. And Father, just do something great here. Uh, not because we're so great. Not because Judah is so great. Not because Israel is so great. Father, we have abandoned you. We have treated you treacherously. There are desolate areas in our life, and we have backslid. But Father, for your glory, we're asking you to do something in this church, something in our families, and something in our lives. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Let all of God's people that agree with this say, Amen. Amen.